message today is a better word for your 2022. A better word. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24 that you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant, or of a new covenant, I should say, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than that, the blood of Abel. Better than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel spoke curse, but the blood of Jesus spoke a better word. And that better word is available, it is real in the situations of life that we face today. And you might be facing a challenge in your circumstances, a challenge in your life today. I'm here to tell you that Jesus has a better word for whatever you're going through in life. We, we recognize from the scriptures that it was a word that spoke the world into existence. It was the word of God, a word. The scripture tells us that God calls those things which be not as though they are. In other words, his word has power, power to recreate. I love it in the gospels when the centurion said to Jesus, you don't need to come to my home. Jesus, just speak the word. And when the Jesus spoke, his servant was healed. The word of Christ, the word of God, it has power for our lives today. And we're, we're told from Hebrews chapter 12, we just read it, that this covenant that we have in Jesus Christ, it speaks a better word, not a word of curse and all the negative stuff that come with the curse, sickness and poverty and depression, that's from the curse. Jesus has a better word for our lives. It's based on the covenant that He has given to us. The Scripture says that when we hear His word, it brings faith to our lives, faith to overcome, faith to live a victorious life, a better word. And so we have a better word for our lives. And you could search the Scriptures and you could find all kinds of good words for our lives, better words based on the, the covenant of Jesus. But I want to share a word today that speaks to the situation I believe that we face today. It comes from the book of Revelation. You may be not expecting me to go to the book of Revelation for a better word for your life today, but the reality is the book of Revelations was written to seven churches who were facing struggles, who were being persecuted. They were going through trial. They were discouraged. And Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, He wrote a letter to them. Seven churches, he wrote seven letters. And that was the premise and basis for this book being written. In fact, just like any book, you go to an opening paragraph, an opening chapter, it sets the tone for the rest of the book. I'll, I'll prove it to you right now before we get to the letter, specific letter that we'll see this word for our lives today. But look at this, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Very first, very opening segue of the, of the book. It says a revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, the point of what we're about to read is to reveal Jesus to us today. And we, re we recognize that when we see Jesus, we're transformed by beholding Him from glory to glory. Uh, Jesus told the religious leaders of His time, He said, you know the Scriptures, but you don't see me, Jesus said. Jesus said, search the Scriptures to see me. And that's what we do here at Celebration Church. When we look to the Scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament, we look to see Jesus and the truths of grace that He reveals through this new covenant that He came to give us. That's where we discover this better word for our lives. So we see Revelation carries the same theme. And then in verse 4 it says, John, to the seven churches. So we see the point of this is to these seven churches who are being persecuted and tried. These seven churches that are in Asia. And what's the word? He said, grace to you and peace. In other words, favor, peace from God toward you, from Him who was and is and what is to come. That's God's word to us today. Favor and peace. And then in verse 5 it says, And from Jesus the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of this earth, to Him who loves us and released us from our sins by His blood. Again, another powerful word for our lives today. You're a new creation. You've been set free. Again, this is the opening segue for this beautiful book, Revelation, this better word for our lives today. You've been released from your sins by His blood. We're going to focus on that in a moment's time. But then verse 6, it says, And He made us a kingdom of priests to His God and Father. 
To Him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. See, this is a message. This is a word for us today. God didn't make you subservient. No, He elevated the unworthy. He elevated those who didn't deserve it. But He elevates us by His grace. He makes us kings. He makes us priests. He gives us authority. Jesus said, I haven't come to call you servants. I've called you friends. See, this is this better word. This is a beautiful, and this is the, these are words from the resurrected Jesus. John, he's getting a vision from, from the throne room of the resurrected Jesus. This is very special. I, I enjoy reading about Jesus in the Gospels, seeing pictures of him in the Old Testament, but these are words coming from the resurrected Jesus, the same Jesus who's alive today at the right hand of the Father. These are words of power. In other words, his words hadn't changed. They haven't changed from the Gospels, hadn't changed from what we see throughout the, throughout the Scriptures. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And rest assured, the resurrected Jesus, alive today, is the same. See, sometimes people read the book of Revelations and get a twisted picture of Jesus, get confused almost. You say, well, this wasn't the Jesus that we read. And why is that? Well, sometimes they'll see Jesus, and we, we, we're looking at that today. We'll look at that in a moment. But see, correction coming. Sometimes he gets a little angry. We say, well, what happened to gracious Jesus of the Gospels? And certainly Jesus was gracious in the Gospels. He came full of grace and truth. A woman caught in adultery said, I don't condemn you. He was a friend of sinners. Uh, religious leaders criticized him. They thought he was too friendly, right? He was gracious, kind towards all. Friend, he said, let the little children come unto me. But let us also not forget that sometimes Jesus did get angry in the Gospels. He did get angry sometimes. In the temple, he got angry, overthrew the tables, threw them out. Uh, but remember, why did he get angry? It's so important to rem remember to recognize why he got angry in the Gospels because the same reason he got angry there is the same e reason he gets angry in the book of Revelation. And I'm preaching this today to let your heart be at ease today, moving forward into an uncertain future, knowing that Jesus hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in the temple, Jesus got angry because the, 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 the religious leaders were, were making it hard for people to worship. They were selling things at, at, at exorbitant fees that people couldn't afford and saying that you had to buy these things so that you could worship God. And, you know, in other words, it was making worship of God difficult, putting stumbling blocks or roadblocks or putting, making it difficult. You see, Jesus was, is, is, was and is always about making it easy to come to God, easy to receive His grace, easy to, to come and receive mercy. And these religious leaders, they were making all kinds of rules. Remember in Mark chapter 3, Jesus got angry at the religious leaders because he wanted to heal somebody on the Sabbath day, and they said he couldn't. And he got, real, he got righteously angry, and he healed them anyhow. You see, Jesus' anger in the Gospels was reserved when self-righteous, dead works religion surfaced its head because Jesus is all about grace, all about freely receiving his mercy, His grace, and new life. And when religious efforts and, and ideas came up, Jesus had to use a bit of shock therapy, get a bit angry, and to push back against these because self-righteous, religious, dead works religion, it, it, it stops people from receiving help from Him. And so it makes them angry. It, it didn't mean that Jesus hated the Pharisees, hated the religious leaders. He just had to use a bit of shock therapy to get through to them because, you know, as long as we think our performance gets God to love us. In other words, if I think that I do well enough through my prayers, my religious efforts, if I think that's going to earn a, a, approval from God, I'll never fully know if He loves me for who I am with warts and all because I always think He's loving me because of my performance. You see, Jesus wants us to know that He loves us warts and all just as I am, as we used to sing in Billy Graham's meeting, just as I am without one plea. God wants us to know that. And so as long as we have this idea of self-righteous religious effort that that can somehow please God, well then it, it, we can't fully receive. We can't fully know we're loved by Him. And that makes Him angry because He loves us. And so I say all that to say that when we see correction in the book of Revelation, recognize it's not that Jesus suddenly turned, turned, changed. No, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not that suddenly Jesus is really vindictive and sensitive and hard to get along with. That's not it at all. No, the anger we see is always in line. He's, he's angry at self-righteous religious effort. And we saw that. We looked at a previous week at the first letter to the book of, to, not to the book, to the church in Ephesus, a real church. And, and they were being persecuted and having a hard time. And Jesus, you know, he even said to them, I'm not reading the letter for sake of time here today, but if you recall, if you heard that message, 
that Jesus said, you're a model church. I'm paraphrasing. You're a model church. You're persevering. You're enduring. You're, you're going through all this stuff, and you're still working hard. But he says, I have this one thing against you. And that was you first left your first love. You left your first love. But we saw that first love is always God's love. We love him because, because he first loved us. We don't love him because, you know, we're not the first movers when it comes to love. He is. In fact, his love is from the foundations of the, of the world. So we cannot beat that. No, his first love is always his love. And so when Jesus says, you left your first love, he's saying, you're working, striving to please me. Kind of like Mar Martha in the scriptures versus Mary. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and received him, received love, received, rested in his grace. This church in Ephesus, they were doing good. I mean, they were the model church when it came to works, but they had, they, they had somehow shifted, drifted away from grace and it says they'd fallen. You know, when it talks about fallen, Paul talked about that in Galatians, they've fallen from grace. In other words, fallen from just resting in his grace. What happens when we do that is we burn out, we get anxious, tired, angry. It, it, Jesus wants us to keep receiving from him and then to serve him. Of course we serve. We've got a great commission, but always in response to his love. And so we saw that, that in, the boat, to, in the letter to the church in Ephesus. Today we're looking at another church, the second letter in, to Smyrna, another real church. And, and when Jesus writes to these seven churches, it also gives us, a, it gives us a, a strength, knowing God's care for the local church. These were local churches. And so it tells us today, even today, that God cares for you and I. We are not islands unto ourselves. He's not distant and aloof. No, he's with us. The scripture says he walks among us and he's here with us today. It gives us hope in dark times, in lonely times, in isolated times. He says, I'm with you. And that's our, these are good words that we receive, better words for our year and life that we receive. And again, these were written to churches, persecuted in dark, difficult times. And maybe that's how you feel today. Well, these are these are to give us good courage and strength. And this church in Smyrna, their pastor had been martyred for his faith. His name was Polycarp. And here's the letter that Jesus, speak, that Jesus gives to John. And it says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The first and the last, speaking of Jesus, who was dead and has come to life, says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by which they say they are Jews but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Five promises that I'll take from, these, from this letter. Five promises that we can take as better words for our lives here today. Number one comes from verse 9 where Jesus said, I know. I know. It says, I know. First promise, Jesus knows and Jesus cares about our struggles. You, you, you're going through a struggle today. You're going through a difficult. Jesus says, remember, this is the resurrected Jesus, alive today. These are his spoken words. He says, I know. In other words, he's not distant, uncaring, unconcerned. No, he says, I know. I know what you're going through. He says, I love you. I have compassion for you and I am with you. We can take that as a better word for our circumstances today and it gives us hope. It gives us hope in dark times. Hope knowing that, that the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, he, he knows. He knows, my, he knows my situation. Sometimes that just does the heart good, just knowing that someone cares. Jesus cares. Second promise comes from uh, the next verse uh, in verse uh, uh, 9. The second part of verse 9 where it says, Those who say they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. What's the second promise from that? Well, this this. Jesus does not hate people. Jesus does not hate people. Uh, 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 notice here, the, the, the enemy, the problem was the synagogue of Satan. In other words, Satan's the enemy. The scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Jesus isn't angry here at anybody other than the religious structures and systems of dead work and self-righteous religion. That's what Jesus is angry at, but Jesus doesn't hate people doesn't hate people. And, then, and we take that to our hearts as well, that you know, maybe there's somebody who's annoying you or doing, doing you wrong. Jesus, let us not hate them either. They're not our problem. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so people are not our problem, even though on the surface it seems like it. 
No, we recognize the, 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 what's behind it all is Satan. But here's the promise for our, here's the better word. Satan's defeated. He was defeated by Christ on the cross, the first and the last. He who holds the keys of death and Hades, he has, he has uh, it, it, we, we didn't read it today, but the book of Revelation, we read it in the previous installment of this series. It says that God, Christ Jesus holds us in his right hand. In other words, the one who's defeated Satan, the one who's behind the problems that they were facing, the persecution and trials and darkness, no, he holds us in his right hand. I tell you what, that's a better word for our lives today recognizing that our enemy behind the situations we face, he is defeated. That was the second promise. Third promise, it comes from the next verse in verse 10. Let's read it. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you'll be tested and you'll have tribulation for 10 days. So that, it doesn't look so promising for them. It looks like a little bit of uh, afflictions and trials. And, you know, that, that, Jesus did say that that would come, afflictions and trials. But here's the third promise from the resurrected Jesus, and it is this. Jesus is not behind your trouble. You see, I love that. Jesus is not behind our trouble. It said the devil is about to cast you into prison. The devil is about to cast you into prison. Again, he's a defeated foe, but recognize this. Jesus is not behind your trouble. Why is that so important? Because our enemy in the scriptures tell us his name is accuser. The devil's name, his accuser. Accuser of the brethren. You see, what happens is he comes and accuses you, and in the accusation he says, You've done wrong, and now God's mad at you, and He's the author of your problems. And I'm sure this church was tempted, maybe you're tempted today, saying, I'm looking around me, it seems dark, it seems like there's too much trouble, maybe God's bringing this on me. Notice here that, the end, that, the, that, that Jesus was not behind their problems. It was the devil. You see, Job is an example of that in the Scriptures. He was a righteous man, he loved God, he served God, and yet he went through some tough times. Remember that. Just because you go through tough times doesn't mean that you've done wrong or that God's angry with you. Job went through some tough times. And yet if you read the whole book, and we're not going to do that right now, but if you read the book, the curtain is opened up and we see that it, it wasn't God behind all his problems. It was Satan. And in the same way today, it's not God behind your problem. It's it's Satan. And so we, we can take courage and strength knowing that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He still has a better word for my life. The first and the last, the Alpha and the Mega, the one who holds the keys of death and Hades. He has my back. He's with me. You see, we, got, we can't listen to the voice of the accuser. And that's what, that's what Paul talked about, spiritual warfare, tearing down strongholds in our minds. Many times those strongholds, they're religious strongholds that tell us that God is not pleased, not that we have to do more to earn favor from Him, that we, we're out of His favor, that we're not, not so much loved by Him anymore. No, we've got to tear that down, resist the devil. James said, resist the devil and he will flee. And so know this, number th third promise, Jesus is not behind the troubles you face today. Fourth promise is this, found in verse 10. It says, do not fear. Do not fear. Most often repeated command or instruction in the Scriptures, do not fear. He says, do not fear what you're about to, trouble, about to suffer. Notice he didn't say you're not going to suffer, it, but he said don't fear. Don't fear. And the fourth promise is, don't fear the devil, and don't fear death. You see, we're, we're in the, we have Christ in us, who is the victorious one, defeated principalities and powers, and no man and the, and the work of evil in their hearts through Satan and the devil might cause them to do harm to our physical bodies and the evil of this world might do. Recognize this, that even in life or death, we are in Christ the triumphant one. And so Jesus says, don't fear. This is good news. This is a better word because this is coming from the resurrected Jesus alive today at the right hand of the Father. And he says, don't fear. Don't even fear death. Because in death there is life. Although it might be bitter on this earth, it is sweet in His presence. Amen? And so He says, don't fear. And so what we see here, and I, we have one promise left. We're getting there. But th this letter and this better word from the resurrected Christ in a difficult time of trying and trials, it is an invitation to walk by faith, not by sight, because sight can sometimes be kind of discouraging uh, but in the natural. But it's an invitation to walk by faith and to receive grace in our daily trials, receive grace where we're at right now, and to live by this better word. He has a word, and it says he is the... He, he is the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. You know, He is a better word. He also has the last word because He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen? And fifth promise is found. We've got to get to that fifth promise. We'll read the last part of verse 10 and then verse 11. And it says in verse 10, Be faithful until death, Jesus says, and I will give you the crown of life. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Uh, uh, so what do we see here? Well, first of all, before I put up the promise, sometimes this is preached and taught that it's a threat. In other words, if you don't overcome, you're not going to receive victory. If you don't, if you don't hold on, if, you don't, if you're weak, you're not going to receive this. Some has taught it that you might lose your salvation. And remember, this is being taught, this letter was originally given to people who had a sword to their throat. They were being put to death for their lives. And so if that's a threat to them, heaven help us here, who aren't really at this point in time facing a sword to our throat. But that wasn't what was happening here. You see, this was a promise. This was a promise and a reason to be faithful. You see, if we read it, he said, be faithful unto death. Uh, this, Jesus is giving us a reason to be faithful, which is very new covenant, which is very grace-focused. You see, what happens, again, that's how we live victorious lives in the new covenant. We receive grace, and then we respond living in victory. See, what, hap- what, was, what we're being shown here is that Jesus is the faithful one. And that's the fifth promise that we see from this passage. Jesus is faithful to the end. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. He is faithful to the end. And when we see Him as our faithful one and faithful to us to the end, it gives us the strength and faith to respond by living a faithful life. You see, I want to live a faithful life. I want you to. I want our church to. Uh, Simply put, it's the best life. Living faithful to Him faithful to those around us, that, that's, that's just the, be- that's the life-giving choice. It's the best choice. But I also recognize that the way to do it, it is not in our own strength, but by seeing Him. Remember, we behold Him and we go from glory to glory. So as we behold Jesus, the faithful one, faithful to the end, it transforms us into living a faithful life. We're not to look to our faithfulness, we're to look to his faithfulness. Like Abraham, you know, Abraham, who's called the father of our faith, he sometimes wavered, sometimes stumbled, sometimes, but, 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 he kept focused on the covenant that he had in, in God, that God had given to him. And we're to do the same today, focus on the covenant, focus on the better word, focus on him who is faithful. In fact, Paul, Paul said in the Scriptures to Timothy that he, Christ is faithful even when we are faithless. You see, that gives us courage and strength, knowing that even if I stumble, he's still faithful to pick me up. The righteous stumble seven times and they keep getting back up. In other words, he's not going to kick you when you're down. He's not going to forsake you when you've had a rough day, you've had a rough time, and you haven't been perfect in your commitment. You haven't been perfect in, you know, your, your confession. And you say, oh, is he angry with me now? Remember, these are people who are having a sword to their throat. And so is he, is he rejecting me now? Is that why this is all happening? No, we must remember that Jesus is faithful to the end. Faithful even when we are faithless. You see, and what happens is when we see him and be start beholding him in the midst of our trials and circumstances and situations, knowing that he is faithful, the one who has the last word, the Alpha and Omega, he has the last word. He has a better word and he has a, he has a good word, but it's the last word and it's a good. When we begin to see that, we become, we be, we'll be amazed how we ourselves become faithful Faithful to Him, faithful to others, faithful to the Great Commission. We become faithful as we see Him who is faithful to us. We become amazed how we ourselves stand up under the pressure of life, pressures of circumstances. As we behold Him who is faithful to the end, He begins to transform us and we become strong. We become overcomers. We become more than conquerors. When He talks about overcoming, remember, the Scripture says, that, 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 that he who overcomes are t- children of God, overcome the enemy, overcome the, the devil. And how? By believing on him. Simply right believing. My friend, it's not works righteousness that helps us to be faithful. It is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ seen in this better covenant, the covenant made through his own blood, the covenant that speaks a better word for our lives today. And so my point of my message, and I'm almost done, my point is see Jesus, who is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, who's faithful to you until the end. Stop looking at your own strength, your own faithfulness. Listen, I want you to be strong, and I want you to be faithful to the end. (laughs) But I know that the way to do it is by looking to him. See him in your trials. See him in your circumstances, who is with you, who holds you in his right hand, 
see him and be amazed how you'll stand up strong under circumstances that you never thought that you could stand up under, how you'll overcome trials and circumstances, health challenges, financial setbacks. You thought, I couldn't do it. Neighbors rejecting you. I couldn't do it. I didn't think I could do it. But you will as you see him who is faithful unto the end. Last verse, and we already read it, but I want to go back to it again. My final point, Revelation 2, 8. Remember, we read it, but let's read it one more time. And it says, To the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, and him and came to life again, who died and came to life again. These are the words. Remember what I started by saying here today? It is his word gives life. He has a better word for the circumstances you, you are facing today. Don't get so bogged down by, it's easy I should say, to get bogged down by the weight of the circumstances, to not be able to see anything different than the doctor's diagnosis or your own failure in a certain area or what the bank is telling you or, you know, or what the news keeps pounding you know, at you. And it's so easy to get bogged down by that. But my friend, I'm here today drawing our attention back to the better word of Jesus Christ who he says he is the first and the last. So not only does he have a better word, a word based based on a covenant of unmerited, undeserved favor, but it's also the last word. In other words, even if at times we stumble or fail, he says, I'm faithful to the end, and my better word for your life, it will last, it will persist, it will remain strong in your life. And when we see that, when we receive that, it becomes an anchor for our soul. It gives us strength. It causes us to be faithful and strong. And maybe you're watching today, you say, I don't know if I could hold on. I don't know if I could. You know, there's just so much going on. Remember this, look to Jesus who is faithful to you until the end. He is your healer. He is your strength. He is your blesser. He is the help in time of need. He has your first word and he has the last word. He calls those things which be not as though they are. He spoke the worlds into existence and his word can recreate the circumstances of your life today. My friend, I wish we were together. I know you're getting excited. People, you're, you're rejoicing in your heart. Because what we're beginning to see is those unseen realms where Christ says all things are possible. Can we pray together right now? Don't, don't leave. I've got a number of things to say, but I know that this is touching individuals' hearts today. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Christ Jesus who gives us a better word. A better word in our circumstances. A better word in our hearts. A better word in our health, a better word in our finances, a better word. And Lord Jesus, today I thank you that by your spirit, in this virtual online realm, Lord, I thank you that you are opening up the eyes of individuals, understanding to see beyond the natural limitations that they face. People who are, feel like they're surrounded by darkness, surrounded by evil circumstances that they can't get out of, like a cobweb. Father, I thank you that today that you give them a supernatural vision, a clarity of focus to see beyond the natural realm, into that unseen realm where your word calls those things which be not as though they are. Lord, I thank you that be nots in our lives change by your word. And now, Lord, I thank you that you have given us your name that we might speak. So, Lord Jesus, right now I speak over families. I speak over finances, health, and the individuals facing challenges that they think they cannot, over, they cannot surmount. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful to us, faithful to the end, faithful to the very end. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful when we are faithless. So Lord, I thank you right now that faith is arising, eyes are being opened. I thank you that ears are now hearing your voice, your love in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, amen. I tell you, my heart is rejoicing today. Not because everything suddenly changes necessarily, although it will, although it, things do change and we expect that. We see praise reports all the time, but you see what happens, we see Jesus. That's the point. That's why we come together to reveal Jesus to see him, to lift him up. Keep looking to him. Stop looking to your faithfulness or your strength. Look to Jesus who's faithful to the end. Look to Jesus who's strong, who has the last word. Finally, in a moment, we're going to go to a report of things happening in our church family. Uh, we're going to partake in the Holy Communion. That's all coming up. Things happening. Elizabeth will be sharing with us. But before we do any of that, maybe you're watching today and you say, I, I, you know, I'm intrigued by what you say, Nathan, but I, I don't know that I know Jesus. I don't know that my sins are forgiven. I don't know that I have a relationship with God. Or, or maybe you say, I, I, you know, I did it one time, but I've drifted away, bought into the lie of the accuser. accuser. Remember I talked about the accuser today, how he, who's the enemy, the devil, who lies and says, you know, God hates you because of your wrongdoing. You know, you had one too many chances. Now he'll never give you another chance. He'll never bless you. He's not faithful to you. Can I tell you? 
God loves you today. And so I invite you as well to, to when I pray in a moment's time, would you pray to receive his love, receive a revelation of how, how much you're loved and forgiven? The scripture says that God prepared this gift for us from the foundations of the earth but that through Jesus Christ it is revealed to us today. So we receive it simply by believing on Jesus. It's as easy as that. So as I pray right now, would you pray with me? Say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for taking my sin, my guilt, my shame, and putting it away. I believe you're alive. Now, Jesus, live in me. And I confess with my mouth, Jesus, you're my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. And I'm so grateful that, to have the opportunity to pray with you today. And I'd love to put some material into your hand. I know we're watching, you're watching in an online realm right now, but you can request it on our website. You can see the information on the screen. We'd love to send you a book if you're in Toronto. We can even mail it to you, or we can give it to you in person here at our church, 190 Railside Road. But I'd be honored to send that to you and so you can get to know more of who Jesus is. That's how we grow. That's how we develop spiritually, by, by discovering more of Jesus and, and his love for us. And also, if you prayed today or are a believer in Christ and have not been water baptized, I invite you to be water baptized. Sunday, February the 20th, here at Celebration Church, right at 190 Railside Road, I invite you to be water baptized. That's a powerful declaration of, of, of your faith in Christ Jesus. It's not your salvation. It's been like, water baptism has been likened to a, a wedding ring where, you know, it's not the marriage, but it, it's a symbol. It's a powerful symbol. And so I invite you to be water baptized. Let us know, February the 